coming up on Marriage Today with Jimmy and Karen. When Karen and I got married, we had no intimacy. I mean, we had sex, but we had no intimacy. Again, because it wasn't going to happen from the outside in the way I thought it was going to. It was going to happen from the inside out. When we began to change on the inside, when God began to change us on the inside, that is when we began to experience the, the intimacy that we have today. Intimacy happens from the inside out, not the outside in. Okay. The more morally depraved a society becomes, the more outwardly focused they have to become because they don't have anything to go to inwardly. And so in our society, because we have become a very morally depraved society, the more that happens, the more we focus on the outside rather than the inside, believing if everything on the outside is right, I'm going to experience everything I'm looking for. It's exactly the opposite. If everything on the inside is right, I'm going to experience what I want. And so you're going to hear me in this message talk about the issue of inhibitors, but you're also going to hear me talk about ethics. Every time I mention an inhibitor of intimacy, I'm going to talk about an ethic of intimacy. Because ethics, the word ethic means a system of principles governing morality and acceptable conduct. In other words, when Karen and I act in our marriage, it's based on the, the ethic of our marriage. There, there's just an ethos in your marriage, whether you realize it or not, that allows and disallows, that causes certain things to happen and keeps certain things from happening. So when Karen and I got married, we had no intimacy. I mean, we had sex, but we had no intimacy. Again, because it wasn't going to happen from the outside in the way I thought it was going to. It was going to happen from the inside out. When we began to change on the inside, when God began to change us on the inside, that is when we began to experience the, the intimacy that we have today. Now, number one inhibitor of intimacy is distraction. The law of priority says, Genesis 2.24, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother. Marriage has to be first. It only works in first place in real terms. It has to come before your children. Your children are precious. Your marriage has to come before your children. It has to come before your work. It has to come before your friends. It has to come before anything else. Our marriage was healed when I hung my golf clubs up. And I stopped playing golf and I made my marriage first again. And so marriage has to be first. And there are two ways that we get distracted. One is the stresses of life. Okay, the stresses means children, work, busyness, things like that. And that's why traditions and disciplines are critical in our marriage because it's not what you can make happen, it's what you can keep happening. Do you have a date night every week? Do you have time alone? Do you have time to talk every day? Do, do you have disciplines and traditions that keep the right things happening? And they're inviolable. No one's getting this time. No one's getting this time. No one's getting this energy. My spouse deserves the best of my life, of my time, energy, everything in my life. And so I'm going to protect this for you. The stresses that come on us can cause us to become distracted. It's, and you can't be intimate with a person who's not paying attention. And they're, and they're not focused, okay? But the other one, the other type of distraction is me turning my heart away in response to frustration or pain. And this is the most dangerous one. Hebrews 13 says, marriage is honorable among, among, among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And the context here is being frustrated with your spouse and beginning to covet other people's spouses and other, other people. But by the way, when the Bible tells us not to covet, uh, in the Old Testament it says don't covet your, covet your neighbor's wife. Coveting, coveting is, is referenced to people. And what, the, what God is saying here is you may get frustrated with your spouse. I get frustrated with you. Your spouse may be imperfect, you're imperfect. But I've said to you, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll never physically leave you and I'll never turn your, my heart away. God has promised all of us, in spite of all of our issues, he will never turn his heart away from us. There'll never be a moment in your eternity that God will ever stop paying attention to you and caring about you. Is that good news, anybody? And, and, okay. So, 
Affairs happen when you turn your heart away. Affairs begin on the inside. Karen and I were on Dennis Rainey's radio program um, a few years ago, and Dennis was interviewing us, um, and he was talking about the early days of our relationship, and Dennis said to Karen, um, when Jimmy was being such a jerk earlier in your marriage, were you ever tempted to have an affair? And, uh, and I was interested in the answer. I mean, I'd never, you know, I thought, well, okay, sister, get honest here. And uh, here's what Karen said. I wouldn't let my heart go there. And this is truth. And because of that, she was fighting for our marriage when I was being a jerk. The most, see, the most important thing in the ethic here is faithfulness. Not just on the outside, on the inside. I'm, I am going to be faithful to you and when I'm frustrated at you and when I'm angry and when things are going bad, I'm not going to turn my heart away to my friends. I'm not going to turn my heart away to sports. I'm not going to turn my heart away to the children. I'm not going to turn my heart away to, to anything else, not another person. In the worst days of our marriage, I'll keep my heart focused on you. Number two inhibitor of intimacy is unresolved conflict. Big, big, big deal is not being able to deal with your issues. Ephesians 4, be angry, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Intimacy is an act of goodwill. Intimacy, the, the fact that you're being able to be intimate means that you're, you've dealt with the issues in your relationship. And here's the four points of Ephesians 4 related to anger. Number one, don't deny your anger. God gets angry. There's nothing wrong with being angry. The second thing it says is don't sin. Be angry, but don't sin. Don't hit, don't yell, don't cuss, don't, don't do, and then tell your spouse, well, you made me mad, and that's the reason I did that. You, go ahead and be angry. There's nothing wrong with anger. I mean, we all get angry, but just don't sin. Don't justify bad behavior. The third thing it says is don't go to bed on that anger. Process it today. Today's anger is very manageable. Today's anger is there's nothing wrong with today's anger. Yesterday's anger is very dangerous anger because now it's, it's being fermented. It's toxic because here's the fourth thing it says. Don't give the devil an opportunity. And the word devil there is the word diabolos. It means slander. When you go to bed on anger, the devil will interpret your spouse to you and slander him in the process. You know, you're laying back to back, not breathing because you don't want to give your spouse the benefit that you're alive. And, 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 and all these thoughts are going through your head. You just had a fight and all these thoughts are going through your head and, and all that kind of stuff. And and all, this thing begins to play out in your mind. See, you go, you go to bed on that often enough and you wake up. Say, here's what I want to say this another way. If you are in the habit of going to bed on your anger, you have been counseled by the devil and you don't even know it. I promise. Be angry. Don't sin. Don't go to bed on your anger. You'll give a foothold to Diabolos. And Diabolos will get in there and convince you that you married the wrong person, that this person will never be right for you, that your soulmate is out there waiting for you and you, you just you know, married the wrong person. All those things are true. And so the, the ethic of unresolved conflict is honesty, is an atmosphere of honesty where you give each other the right to complain. See, when, when people come in for marriage counseling, a lot of times what we hear is, I could never say this to them. They would go ballistic. I mean, when I was just really messed up, as a young man, I remember coming to Karen and I thought, Karen's my best friend and I'm going to tell her that I'm struggling in this area. And I remember coming to Karen and, and saying to her, I just want you to know this and this and this. And Karen never went, oh, you, oh, that's just awful. Shame on you. And oh, don't you ever tell me anything like that again. You're sick. And uh, <laughs> I would come to Karen and I would, you know, confess something to her or share something with her and things like that. And she'd say, okay, thank you for being honest with me. And, and then we would talk. And because she was so approachable and she didn't shame me and react to me, I felt safe around Karen. And so an atmosphere of honesty just says, please tell me. And, and I, even if I don't agree, I'll, I'll respect you and I'll listen. And when you make a decision, the, the, the ethic of honesty says, we're not going to hide stuff. And we're not going to make each other pay a price for being honest. We're going to have an honest relationship here. Everything good happens in the light. Everything bad happens in the darkness. And if you don't let your spouse be honest, it doesn't mean there aren't problems. It just means you'll never know about them. 
The, the worst marriage in the, in the world is two selfish people in a marriage. The greatest marriage is two servants in love. And I'm not happy till you're happy. And here's the, here's the kingpin question in marriage. Are you okay? Are you okay? An honest question to your spouse that says, are you okay? And I would have never asked Karen that question early in our marriage because she would have answered it. <laughs> and I was terrified of, I asked her that question regularly. She asked me. I said, are you okay? And here's what that means. If you're not, I'll, I'll crawl through cut glass to make you okay. Because the number one thing I do in life is serve Jesus. The second thing I do in life is serve you. I want you to know you were made to love. God is such an intimate God. Jesus prayed in John 17 that we would be one with him and be one with each other. One. It's such a profound intimacy that we were born to have, that we were created to have, that the word for it is one. Indistinguishable from one another. We're so integrated into each other in a healthy way. You were created by love to love. You were created by one to be one. That's who you are. And all that we experience in life, all of our ignorance and all of our hurts that stand against that, thank God those things are on the outside, not the inside. But what's inside is God. And when you look at these issues and you go through these issues and you're just honest, sit down and talk about them, pray about them. Things don't happen instantly, but the process begins instantly. You can make it in marriage. You have a 100% chance of success in marriage when you do it God's way. Doesn't matter what your past is about, your future is about God. I hope you enjoyed that teaching. You know, we have an entire five-part series called Becoming One. And what you just saw there is just a small part of this entire series. This is a, a new seminar that we've done uh, along with uh, Nancy Houston and also Caroline Leaf, Dr. Caroline Leaf, talking about becoming one soul, becoming one mind, becoming one flesh, becoming one heart. And I'm also talking about the seven inhibitors of intimacy. And so I hope that this program today was a blessing to you. There's so much more though to the entire seminar and conference that we did called Becoming One that can really change your marriage. In fact, it can change your family. Uh, all around you, people all around you can be changed. I want to encourage you right now to, to support us financially here at Marriage Today. Be generous with us because we're a ministry and a mission. We go all across America and around the world. And right now for your gift of any amount to support us here at Marriage Today, we want to get you the CD single, Becoming One Soul. And that's talking about having being soulmates. Big deal that we need to know about. Also right now for your gift of $55, we want to get you the five-part CD series, Becoming One, along with our one devotional book that will really bless you. It's a great thing to do as a couple to deepen your marriage. For your gift of $75 or more, we want to get you the DVD series, Becoming One, along with our one devotional book. These are fantastic resources that will take your marriage to the next level. We want to get these to you. Here's how you can get them. When you get married, God is joining you heart to heart, spirit to spirit. That's what's happening there. Experience the Becoming One series on CD or DVD and receive the one devotional book as a free bonus. The CD series and book are yours for a gift of $55 or more. The DVD series and book for a gift of $75 or more. In this impactful series, Jimmy Evans and special guests Nancy Houston and Dr. Caroline Leaf reveal how couples can have one heart, one body, one mind, and one soul. When you add God to your marriage, your marriage becomes one in God. When you support marriage today with a gift of any amount, we'll send you the CD single, Becoming One Soul. Soulmates are not born, they're made in the trenches of life. Discover the secrets to having a thriving relationship. Experience the joy of becoming one. Well, I hope you're enjoying this program. It is on becoming one. It's on being intimate. 
and becoming, you know, one heart and one soul and one flesh. And so, you know, Karen, we have some questions from our viewers, and I want to begin by by uh, reading this question. This is for you. And this lady writes and says, Karen, my husband doesn't focus on our marriage like he used to. How can I get his heart to turn back to our relationship? I think there are millions <laughs> of women watching right now, mm -hmm. and that's what they would say to you. What, what, how, well, what I think the uh, reason that a lot of women would say that is because sometimes we get in a rut in our marriages, mm -hmm. and we just do our daily routine, same old thing, in and out. You need to start having children. You know, and so the things that we used to do when we were first married or dating, you know, they become and kind of get closer and closer backed away or backed off and, and little things start coming before our marriage. You know, before you know it, you're like two different people living in the same house. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I know she, she said, you know, he's not focused on our marriage. Um, but, you know, I take it a step closer and say, is he focused on you? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, uh, I think that that's the thing that you have to guard in a marriage is just making sure that each other, that we keep the focus of you and me, uh, the priority of yeah. everything that goes on in the home. Yeah. And it's work. I mean, it takes a sacrifice somewhere else that you've got to say no to, to make that come back to. And so, um, or come back to that position that you want. And so for her, you know, I, you know, I can't talk to your husband, but I can talk to you. And so, you know, let's just go down the line of what you did before that he was attracted to you about. You know, was it how you presented yourself? Is it how you talked? Was there something that you two shared together? Was there something that um, uh, he just always loved about you and now he hates about you? I mean, you know, kind of take a step back and start doing the evaluation right. of, you know, what have you done to change? And if that hasn't been true, then the only thing else I can say at this point is you might need to consider counseling and then start really praying, praying for the Lord to give you wisdom. You know, how can I bring him back into this? You know, what's going on in his heart that maybe you need to be praying about for him? That, um, you know, the enemy wants to destroy us. I mean, he doesn't want us to be married. You know, there's no marriage that he wants to be successful. So you're going to be attacked in your marriage somehow. And, he, and the enemy knows how to get into your marriage. So, you know, consider, you know, is, is this an attack that he he's doing on my husband is the enemy attacking or finding a way to get to my husband and do you just need to war for him or is this something that's just a simple thing of communication you know honey have i said or done something that's hurt your feelings in the past you know are are we just you know is, is there something else i can do to help you know you feel more connected in this marriage are you too focused on the kids there's so many things that we could talk about you know but don't be discouraged because we all go through these things all of us and it's, it's just a normal part of the a growth of your marriage. That's a, that's a perfect response, Karen. And, and I want to say from a male perspective, we don't need what you need. Mm -hmm, exactly. And she <laughs> says, my husband's heart is turned away from the marriage. Well, you're, a, a man needs honor, mm -hmm. okay? And when a man feels disrespected, it's like a force field to him mm -hmm. that it's hard for him to come <laughs> into. Yeah. Well, it's, it's hard for us to come into an environment where we feel disrespected. Mm -hmm. We need sex. That's mm -hmm. a big need. But another thing is friendship. Mm -hmm. You know, I, we want our wives to be our buddy, not our mother. Exactly. You start mothering us, we're out of here. I'm not talking about leave divorce. I'm just <laughs> saying I'm going to the other room and mm -hmm. I'm going to watch, you know, boxing or something. But, but I don't want to be mothered. You know, I had I had a mother and I don't want another one. I, so and it's you know, easy to get caught up in the mother hole. Yeah, it's I want easy. I want a buddy. And there was a I was watching a preacher on TV one day and he was talking about a couple in their congregation. His heart had turned away. Mm -hmm. She was a, a wise woman fighting for their marriage. And so the question was, my husband's heart's not here. How do I get it back? Mm -hmm. She went hunting with him. Mm -hmm. And sure. it healed their marriage. Exactly. And the, the pastor was saying, she came to her husband and said, honey, I know you love to hunt. She didn't hunt. Mm -hmm. And she said, I want to go hunting with you. Your husband, you, you, what will be happening is you'll go into your husband's world and you'll be sitting there having fun with him. And you're just sitting there having fun. The next thing you know, he'll open up to you. Exactly. And right. the things he hasn't said to you in a year, he'll mm -hmm. begin to say, because now you're his friend and mm -hmm. I, I trust my friends. So, and, and we don't want to talk to the wives and like the men don't have issues. The men have big <laughs> mega issues. But, but I'm saying, I'm saying that your, your response, Karen, was exactly right. And that you went back, your, when you were answering the question, you went back and said, remember the beginning. Mm -hmm. That's the perfect answer mm -hmm. because there, what, what attracted him to you mm -hmm. and what are you doing different now mm -hmm. than you were then? And that, that's it. Yeah.
that's the answer. That's good. So we, we hope that that is, that that is a helpful, because I, I, I totally agree with everything Karen said. And let me say, my heart was not in our marriage. And this woman right here, she, she not only prayed me back in the spiritual sense, which is a big deal, she loved me back. She came into my world, turned my head around, turned my heart around, and that's why we're married today. Listen, if we can be married, anybody can be married. <laughs> Hello. Okay. So it's, it's the truth. <laughs> Listen, thank you for joining us today. We got something really important we want to tell you. Watch this. I hope this program today has been a blessing to you. We love coming to you to encourage you in your marriage, in life, in general. You know, marriage today is under attack. There is absolutely no doubt about it. It's just under attack. And we raise a standard. Marriage today exists to come to you and to people all across America and around the world and help them to succeed in marriage. We see the media, we see the entertainment industry, we see our own government so disrespectful of marriage, the way God created it. And today we see an absolute assault against the family unit and against traditional marriage. Marriage today exists to raise the standard, God's standard for marriage. And so would you help us? We're asking you, if you're blessed by this ministry, if you believe in what we're doing, the information is there on your screen of how you can call us, how you can write us and send us a gift, or how you can go online right now on our secure website and give to support Marriage Day. No gift is too small, no gift is too large. And everything that you give to us goes to minister to marriages, to keep little children together with their parents, to keep families intact, and to give the next generation hope that marriage works. Marriage works 100% of the time when you do it God's way. We all have a 100% chance of success in marriage when we do it according to God's design. And that's what we love to do. We love to give people hope. We love to give people help. And we have seen tens of thousands of marriages saved, millions of people's lives touched across America and around the world, but we can only do it because of the help of people like you. I'm asking you if you would right now to give your most generous gift to support us here at Marriage Today. And you can also become a monthly partner and get a special resource that only our partners get. And the information is on your screen right now of how you can become a partner. Thank you so much for your faithful support for Marriage Today. God bless you. Going through divorce is a lot to ask of children and often results in years of emotional pain. It's a violent ripping apart of their parents and a sense of abandonment. What sometimes we see as a quick way out can mean complete loss for a child. You have a 100% chance of success in marriage. You, you were made for marriage. Marriage Today exists to protect children from the pain of divorce and to steer couples away from marital failure by telling them the truth. When you stand with Marriage Today, your individual effort multiplies with other like-minded partners, and together we can rebuild a legacy of strong families around the world. Choose your level of partnership today and receive immediate access to the video streaming library. Become a rock-solid partner today. In today's teaching, we're discussing intimacy and how you can have a more passionate marriage. Real closeness involves all areas of our being, our hearts, minds, souls, and bodies. Intimacy doesn't just happen from the outside in. Intimacy happens from the inside out. Right now, we're about to hear from Nancy Houston, a licensed Christian sex therapist. She will share with you how you and your spouse can experience real intimacy and become one together. Sex is again hard to talk about and oftentimes it's because we there's a lack of education i remember one woman i worked with she came in she'd been married for probably 25 years and she said you know i hate sex and i said well tell me about that what about sex do you hate and she said well i just feel like it's for my husband and it's his pleasure and my duty i'm like i don't think that's what god wants for your sex life at all sex is not about you doing your duty. This is for your pleasure. And he wants that for you girls. Um, then oftentimes there's a lack of education and then there can be rigid religious views. I remember one pastor I worked with 
And he just thought sex was so dirty and disgusting and never felt comfortable making love with his wife. And um, so we started talking about his background. Well, he came from a really rigid religious family where he was told that sex is dirty and bad and don't ever do that. You know, too many times we tell our youth groups, don't we, sex is dirty, save it for the one you love. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? And then Christian couples get married and they can't find the on switch because they've learned how to repress all those sexual feelings for so long. I take a little bit of a different approach. I believe that God created us as sexual creatures. Did you know that we all have an automatic sexual nervous system? And if you're exposed to sexual stimuli, your body will have a response. It doesn't mean that you are dirty or bad. Actually, it's a great opportunity for you to go, God, thank you, everything's working. Now I can just move on. Also, we can just feel a lot of shame. Did you know that when boys are 8 to 10, they learn that initiating sex is their responsibility and that sexual rejection soon becomes the hallmark of masculine shame? Men have deep feelings about sexuality. When I interview men about how they feel about having, making love to their wife, do you know they say, I always feel a little bit taller. I have more confidence. Something deep down happens inside of me when my wife wants to receive me and make love to me. So sometimes women, we just need to be reminded about that because that is not what our culture says. Thank you for watching Marriage Today with Jimmy and Karen. Subscribe to Marriage Today's YouTube channel for more marriage building videos and updates.